right? Shiny faces. Well, that's that light up there. Maybe that's what it is. All right, so um, I pretty much got through what I wanted to say uh, yesterday about DNA replication. It was a little rushed at the end, so I wanted to just say a few words about telomeres and tel uh, telomerase so you'd have a, a little uh, more of an understanding of that. So um, first of all, I didn't show you yesterday because I was in a little bit of a hurry um, the um, way in which uh, telomerase actually does what it does. So um, telomerase, like any DNA polymerase, can only work in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction can only work in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. So if we're talking about being at the end of a chromosome, then the only end that it can extend is the 3 prime end. It can't extend the 5 prime end. So we think about telomerase binding, and it puts down this RNA template that it copies, and it copies, and it copies, and it copies, like the Ever-Ready Bunny, uh, right? Over and over and over. But all that's doing is extending the 3 prime end. So you can see a little bit of that right here prime end hanging off of that. So then how does the 5 prime end get filled in? That'd be a good exam question, so I'll just throw it out there and let you tell me. How do you think the 5 prime end would get filled in? What's that? There's no cuts, no. No, there's no cuts. A primer would be added, OK. So there's a type of replication that we've talked about that would be consistent with that. What is it? Oh, well, go ahead and say what you're going to say. Uh, well, ligase will play a role in it, yes. But ligase can't fill in the gap, right? What's going to fill in the gap? So polymerase, it could be polymerase 1, it could be polymerase 3, all right? But something that's got to first put down a primer. So we see an RNA primer that gets put down. So primase is the first thing that's going to come in. And it's going to fill that guy in, or at least put it down an RNA primer. Then a DNA polymerase, whether it's either DNA polymerase 1 or 3. This is a eukaryotic cell, so they have a different name. But we'll consider them as if they're 1 and 3. Comes in and fills in. DNA ligase, of course, is going to close up the gap. But then when something comes along, and removes the, the RNA primer, we still have a gap, right? Everybody see that? Still have a gap. Now, the answer to that little gap that's at the end where the RNA primer was is that that will never be filled in. That will never be filled in, OK? So your chromosomes, as you got from your parents, they got elongated when you were a fertilized egg all had that little tiny gap at the end. The big gap, OK, the big gap got filled in. All right? But there's a little tiny gap at the very end that did not get filled in by the polymerase because there was no way to prime it and start it. Okay? But the, it, the result of the action, a little noisy out here. The result of the action of the telomerase was to extend the end from about right here. And look, we could imagine it could get extended out here with perhaps a little piece hanging off of the end. So the point is that telomerase did make the end of the chromosome longer. And the result of that was that now this can go through many more divisions without loss of important DNA sequences. OK? Everybody understand that? OK. That's how telomerase does what it does. Kind of cool. Um, eukaryotic polymerases, there's a bunch of names. They use Greek letters to name them. We're not going to worry about the names. Uh, there's actually quite a few DNA polymerases in eukaryotic cells. And they appear to have some very uh, specialized functions. We don't know in every case what the uh, function of each DNA polymerase is in eukaryotic cells. We do know, uh, for example, that there's a, uh, a mitochondrial DNA polymerase because mitochondria have their own uh, genome. They have their own DNA, and that DNA has to be replicated. They, al they also have an unusual replication uh, scheme that we won't talk about here. But you can see that some of the features that we've seen of other things, like the 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease, is present in some of these, but not all of these uh, polymerases. 
you can see that some DNA polymerases um, of eukaryotic cells actually have a primase associated with them. So there's where the primase activity uh, actually happens. But again, the primase is going to make an RNA starter, not a DNA starter. There are no DNA polymerases that will start uh, all by themselves. OK. And there's blah, blah. Um, I'll just point out here, since I, sometimes people ask me, and I didn't uh, mention it in class, that we're not going to worry again about these over here. So uh, as you can see, some of them have function unknown. This function unknown is likely the most common DNA polymerase in eukaryotic cells, actually. <laughs> so it turns out we're, our, our knowledge of this ha is rapidly changing. Now, um, I show this over here because I've talked about polymerase 1 and I've talked about polymerase 3 in prokaryotic cells. Uh, polymerase 2, people say, well, what, where did polymerase 2 fit into the scheme? Polymerase 2 isn't a very important polymerase in terms of cell life. Uh, you can eliminate the polymerase from uh, a bacterial cell, and the bacterial cell will remain alive. Uh, but it appears to play a role in repair. So there were some repair functions that polymerase 2 has. And 4 and 5 are really odd. They weren't even realized they were po DNA polymerases for a long time uh, because they only um, exhibited DNA polymerase activity under really unusual circumstances, usually resulting from DNA damage uh, that had happened. And this one right here, I think it's number five, um, is, uh, it has another name, which I won't, I won't go into here, but uh, polymerase five turned out to be really horrendous at copying DNA. Its error rate was really, really large. And it, it was so large, in fact, that people didn't even realize it was a DNA polymerase at the time. Um, but it was being invoked when um, a DNA had suffered a major damage. And it appears that what it's doing is it's able, actually, to um, overlook some of the errors and make guesses in terms of what the, the sequence should be. So people call this guy the sloppier copier, which I thought was kind of a cool name, the sloppier copier. OK, so don't worry about the differences. I'm just showing you the table for your information. There's nothing in there that I'm going to expect you to specifically remember. All right, well, that finishes what I want to say about DNA uh, synthesis. I want to turn our attention now to RNA synthesis. And RNA synthesis has a name. Um, RNA synthesis is called, but RNA synthesis is called transcription. Now, students commonly confuse transcription and translation. Don't do that. I can guarantee you about a third of you on the exam are going to try to tell me that one of them is the other. Okay? So transcription simply refers to the copying of DNA to make RNA. And translation simply involves using the genetic code to convert, convert RNA to protein. So translation is the synthesis of protein. Now, um, RNA synthesis is different from DNA synthesis in several respects. So first of all, there is a DNA polymerase that, I'm sorry, DNA, an RNA polymerase that catalyzes the synthesis of RNA. No surprise there. RNA polymerase catalyzes the synthesis of RNA. It uses DNA as a template to copy. A major difference with RNA polymerase compared to DNA polymerase, though, is that RNA polymerase does not require a primer. RNA polymerase will start synthesis of a strand without a primer. Very big difference right there. Okay. Um, not needed. Um, like DNA polymerase, RNA synthesis, RNA polymerase only works in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. That's absolutely. And another difference is in the process of transcription, only one of the strands is copied. So in DNA uh, synthesis, we saw both strands being copied. We had the leading strand and we had the lagging strand. We don't have that in transcription. We only have copying of one strand. Now another thing about transcription is DNA synthesis copies the entire DNA. Transcription only copies a portion of the DNA. And it's copying a specific portion of the DNA that the cell needs protein from. Okay? 
That's an important consideration. So if the polymerase didn't have the proper way to stop that we'll talk about, then it would continue all the way around a bacterial chromosome, for example, and make something six million base pairs long that would be of very limited use for the cell. So we'll see that the process of transcription has a sequence of events, initiation to start the process, uh, elongation to um, make this thing, and then the termination to finish off the process. OK. Now, to understand um, transcription, we need to understand a little bit about how the cell knows where to start. So when we think about initiation, we have to think about how does the cell start the process, and how does the cell know where to start the process? All right. Well, when we talked about replication, where did I say replication started? What was the name of the sequence where replication started? Origin, right? OK, transcription starts at a specific sequence, and that specific sequence is called a promoter. It's not at the promoter, but it's adjacent to the promoter where the transcription starts. So it's adjacent to the promoter. Okay. Well, what is a promoter? A promoter is a sequence in the DNA that is recognized by the transcription proteins. And the transcription proteins catalyze or start the synthesis of RNA adjacent to that promoter. Okay? So it's a sequence that's recognized by the transcription proteins, and those proteins stimulate the synthesis of an RNA adjacent to that promoter. What are we looking at in the screen here? What we're looking at is the sequence of a whole bunch of sections of DNA of different genes from E. coli. So E. coli is the bacterium in our gut. And if we focus our attention over here, this is the very first, what you see in yellow, is the very first nucleotide that's made into a messenger RNA. It's the very first base that's copied for any given gene. Okay? So this gene, era BAD, for example, starts with an A and then continues along that. Notice it says T because we're talking about DNA, but if we were um, copying that in, in RNA, then that would be a U, of course. Right? OK. Now, what are these guys? What's this and what's this? Well, people were very curious to understand originally how it is what that transcription starts, where it is the transcription starts. And so they determined all of these sequences. And they said, are there any common features? Because we know where the transcription starts. Are there any common features that are in the area that the DNA, pro I'm sorry, that the, the, the transcription proteins might recognize? Because what has to happen is the proteins involved in transcription have to bind to DNA at a specific place and then start that synthesis, in this case, next to it. Well, when they lined all these things up, what they discovered was that there were some uh, similar sequences that were found adjacent to those start sites. Okay? If we look here in purple, we see something called the Pribno box. And David Pribno was the first person uh, to recognize the similarity of these sequences. And this is also called a minus 10 sequence. It's called a minus 10 sequence because if we start numbering the first nucleotide made into RNA, we count backwards 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 or so, 9 or 10. Okay? About 10 bases back, we see a common sequence that's a popping up for many genes. Now, you'll notice that sequence is not identical for each gene. So we have common sequences that are 10 nucleotides away called a Pribno box. I'm going to explain the significance of that in a second. When they looked further, they discovered that at about minus 35, and you can see there's some variability in terms of where that is actually located, there's a GC-rich region that's out there okay, um, that looks like this. Okay? I shouldn't say GC-rich because it actually has Gs, Cs, As, and Ts. But um, 
a region that had a lot of similarity to each other, not identical, but a lot of similarity to each other at minus 35. And that's called the minus 35 sequence. So again, you could count back 35 nucleotides, and there you'd be. Well, what are these things, and what are their significance? Okay. Well, let's focus on the Pribno box, since that's what I talk most about. The Pribno box um, is something that has, we look at what's called a consensus sequence. If I take and say, what's the first, the first, the first? Well, I start looking through the first part of that sequence, and it's pretty much a T, right? So the, I get what I call a consensus. On average, 79% of the time, that first base is a T, okay? 95% of the time, the second base is an A. 44% of the time, it's a T, et cetera. When I look at that consensus sequence, I could think of this as the sort of average, or I could even think of it as the best sequence that is in front. Because it's the one that's the most common sequence that would occur in front of any gene that's being started. Well, this is interesting that about 10 nucleotides away, we have, first of all, strong conservation of the sequence, meaning it hasn't varied a lot from different genes. And second of all, that it's AT rich. What did I tell you about AT base pairs? They're weaker, right? There's only two hydrogen bonds between AT base pairs, and there are three hydrogen bonds between GCs. One of the things that has to happen during transcription is the RNA polymerase is only going to copy one strand which means that it has to somehow separate the strands and then copy only one. Well, separating the strands takes energy. And if you have something that requires less energy, it sort of makes sense that you would put that sequence close to where you want the transcription to start. So this provides, the Pribno box provides an entry point for the RNA polymerase. It's a place for it to open up the strands and literally get in between there. Okay. Now, the minus 35 region doesn't have that role, okay? And it likely plays a uh, has a function in recognition. Okay. This has a function in recognition as well. What's recognition mean? All right. Well, I said that the transcriptional proteins have to bind to these sequences. That is, they have to find them. Because these sequences say, hey, there's a gene in the area here. Right? So the transcriptional proteins recognize, and in the case of E. coli, RNA polymerase itself will recognize this okay, and bind to it. Well, why do we have, why do, why do E. coli or why do any cells have different sequences? Why don't they have the identical same sequence there? And the answer to that lies in the fact of the needs of the cell, OK? The needs of a cell. Let's think, go back to DNA polymerase. I, told, I talked about DNA polymerase 3. And I said that it was the primary DNA polymerase of cells. And I said that it, it would actually get onto a DNA, and it will just stay on it all the way through, like doing that leading strand. It doesn't have to come off or do anything. It just goes all the way through and makes the DNA. You don't need, or a, uh, a cell doesn't need, very many DNA polymerase threes. On the other hand, there's a lot of Okazaki fragments, and each Okazaki fragment requires a DNA polymerase one. The cell needs a lot more DNA polymerase ones. If all the sequences in front of all the genes were the same, the cell would copy exactly the same number of all of the messenger RNAs. And it would make exactly the same amount of all the proteins. Well, that would be a horrible waste of energy if you have, for example, DNA polymerase threes sitting around doing nothing. Because cells are living very close to the edge, and they need to be efficient in their use of energy, because it takes a lot of ATP to do all the things that cells do. So why waste energy making a protein that I'm not going to use? Okay. So what I'm getting ready to talk about. Yes, Mariah? Um, can I understand why you wouldn't wear normal tiny and just like one of the transcriptions where it's only mm -hmm. the RNA polymerase that you're going to Yep. So what's going to make it happen for minus 35 Okay. Okay. Let me, let me try to say a little bit, and then I, if you're still not, not clear, I hope that that'll help. Okay? So um, I can't tell you why there are two sequences. Okay? That's 
all I can answer to that is that's the way the system evolved. But the, the, both of these together okay, are important for gene expression. Right, so let me get to say, say a little bit about gene expression. So, so cells with gene expression are trying to make the right amount of any given protein. The right amount. Okay. Well, if I have a sequence that, let's say, the RNA polymerase really likes, what's it going to do? It's going to bind there. It's going to make a lot of messenger RNA. And if I have a sequence that the messenger RNA doesn't like as much, it's not going to bind as much. It's not going to make as much messenger RNA. We're starting to understand, with the difference in sequences that we see, we're starting to understand how cells are controlling the amount of proteins that they make. These sequences evolved to this point so that the cell has a sequence that it really, really likes. This is one it would really like, for example, okay? associated with a gene that's very important. I don't even know what this gene is, but a, a sequence like that, the cell is going to really like, and it really wants to make a lot of. And if it doesn't make a lot of that, the cell is going to die if it needs more than it can make, right? And it may die if it makes more than it needs. So the selection process has allowed cells to evolve Okay, differences in sequence that can be exploited to make the proper amount of protein. Now, that's getting a little he te techno, so let me back up. Let's just look at this sequence. Notice I said the cell would really like this one. You might say, well, how do you know they'd really like that one? Well, it turns out that when we look at the consensus sequence and we compare the amount of a messenger RNA that's made and we look at the sequence ahead of it, things that are closest to the consensus sequence, the cell will make the most of. Okay? So this sequence, which is identical to the consensus sequence, is one that the, the RNA polymerase will bind, and it will make a ton of that protein. Something that's very far from there, TGT, CAT, is a ways away from there. The cell, the RNA polymerase, is not going to recognize this very well and it's not going to make as much of that messenger RNA. Does that make sense? Yes, Moran? And so the consensus is the best of an average of how It is an average. That's exactly right. Okay. So it's the best. This is the most common sequence that occurs. And you can think of that as the average. Yes, you could. Okay. Well, that's pretty cool, all right? It's pretty cool because now differences in sequence, and by the way, when I talk about the promoter, this is the promoter. These regions are the promoter. The promoter is thought of as a control region, and the promoter is the place where the transcription proteins bind. Well, we know that the transcription proteins bind in this area. Other questions here? Yeah. That sounds like the RNA is made rather than exposed to man to take on the Okay, very good observation. Very good observation. Um, when we think about how RNA is made, statistics is one consideration. We're going to see some um, mechanisms that cells have in place that override those statistics. Okay? But if we just think about sitting around on average, you are exactly right. Statistics are one way of doing that. On average, I'm not going to need as much DNA polymerase 3 as I need DNA polymerase 1. That's a statistical question. Now, I'll give you a quick example in terms of where we're headed with this. All right. If we look in bacteria, bacteria have something called the lac operon. And the lac operon is a set of genes that cells use to metabolize the sugar lactose. Cells don't always have lactose. So they don't want to be making the proteins in this operon if there's no lactose. But they want to be making a ton of it if there is lactose. So they have an, what's called an inducible system that will turn on those proteins when lactose is present and turn off the synthesis of those proteins when lactose is absent. So it's not purely statistical. okay? It, it depends on the sort of needs of the cell. But statistics 
are a good way of controlling an awful lot of genes of a cell. Very good observation. OK. Well, let's um, talk about what's happening. So we can actually see here what's happening in the process. Here's an RNA polymerase, RNA Paul. And you see that it's got attached to it a little protein with a designation sigma. Okay? This little sigma is a protein unto itself. It's called sigma factor. And by the way, RNA polymerase is comprised of several proteins. It's a multi-subunit protein. Okay? So sigma is one of those proteins. And we'll see sigma comes on and goes off and comes on and goes off. Okay? Sigma is bound to the RNA polymerase, as you can see here, before transcription starts. And sigma is essential for the transcription process to get started because it's actually sigma that recognizes the promoter. Sigma recognizes the promoter. It recognizes, it binds to it, and therefore allows the RNA polymerase to be at the right place for transcription to start. We can see the strands being opened up here. We can see the first nucleotide being put in. Remember, we start with triphosphates. So this would be, in this case, whatever that is, purine. That could be ATP, for example. Okay, ATP starting there. And then we see the movement of the polymerase and the movement of this is called a bubble. Movement of this bubble as the polymerase starts moving to the right, going 5 prime to 3 prime. Yes? being made 5 prime to 3 prime, it's reading 3 prime to 5 prime. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Oh, <laughs> not quite. Okay. So this goes a little ways, and then we see that the sigma factor disappears from the equation. Okay? So sigma factor typically disappears in about the first 10 nucleotides or so, and then the polymerase is off and running. So when the sigma factor is released, that's the end of the initiation phase of transcription. That's the end of the initiation phase of transcription. So after about the first 10 nucleotides or so, sigma factor is released. We've finished the initiation phase. We're getting ready to start the elongation phase for transcription. OK. Um, Elongation is not very glamorous or exciting. It goes along the way okay, and does its thing. Well, I, should, I should actually show you something here. So let me point out something in the chain of events. Okay. So um, don't worry too much about There's some nomenclature here, open promoter complex. Don't worry about that and the various things uh, here. You should um, understand something about the different strands. Okay. So. The two strands in a DNA, I said we only copy one strand. The strand that's copied has a name. It's called the template strand. The strand that's copied is called the template strand. And the strand that's not copied is called the coding strand. And the reason it's called the coding strand is that it has the same sequence as the messenger RNA, except for since it's DNA, it's going to have T's instead of, I'm sorry, it's going to have U's. It's going to have T's instead of U's, as you would see in the RNA. Okay? So the template strand is the strand that gets copied, and the coding strand is the strand that's not copied. All right. Well, as I said, elongation is not very exciting. It moves along. Um, and at some point, the RNA polymerase has got to know where to stop. Because I said it doesn't go around and copy the entire DNA. It only wants to copy a certain segment, because that would be really another waste of energy. If it's copying things it doesn't need, the cell is wasting its energy. So again, cells are efficient. Well, it turns out in E. coli that cells have two ways of terminating transcription. Two ways of terminating transcription. Now, the first one is a very cool one that you can see here. It's called the factor-independent uh, model. 
or not my show, factor independent mechanism. Factor independent mechanism. Now, let me try to, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this in just a second. Uh, I thought I had it on there. I don't have it on there. All right, never mind. Let's imagine I am a, uh, an RNA polymerase. I'm going to go back to here. Well, let me see. I thought I had a figure I don't have. That's my problem. Um, let's look at the DNA that's being copied by the RNA polymerase. All right? So there's the double-stranded DNA that's being copied. And we're nearing the place where the transcription termination needs to occur. All right? And this would be, for example, a sequence that the RNA polymerase would copy. And if it copied it, this is the sequence of RNA that it would produce. Okay? So we'd have a whole bunch of 5 prime up here. And we get down to this. And notice what this, this sequence can do. It can form base pairs with itself. When I showed you earlier how tRNAs had structure, or how ribosomal RNAs had structure, that was a strand that was pairing on itself. Here's a messenger RNA sequence that's pairing on itself. The RNA polymerase is up here. We can imagine this DNA sequence continues all the way out here. The RNA polymerase sequence is up here. It's copying this DNA sequence. But all of a sudden, this thing goes, oh, wow, look, I've got friends over here. I'm going to pair. What happens? Well, this thing pairs. And it's right underneath the RNA polymerase, which is sitting on the DNA. This acts like the jack of a car. It lifts the butt end of the polymerase up and kicks it off of the DNA. And it happens solely because that sequence is present. There's nothing else that it takes. It just comes off. That's all there is to it. Now, Look at the, there's another thing about this that's kind of cool. Here's the sequence that forms the pairing. Look at the sequences around where that thing pairs. U, 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 U. What's that going to pair with? A, 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 A. Again, weak base pairing. It's easier for this to peel off of the DNA, and that's exactly what happens. Now, there's one thing I meant to show you earlier that I didn't, that I want to come back and show you just to let you understand this a little better. And you'll notice how when the RNA polymerase is going along, that a lot of the RNA is hanging off. It's not remaining base paired. It forms a tail, okay? Which means that if we think about this sequence forming, and the RNA polymerase is here, that's the part that's lifting up right there, and then everything falls apart. So there's only a few base pairs at any given time that are paired with the DNA. So if the only thing holding that structure together is the U's paired with A's, it's not a very strong pairing. The formation of that jack to lift the end of the RNA polymerase up is sufficient to remove the entire thing. And it, the whole thing falls apart at that point. Well, when the RNA polymerase falls off, of course, the RNA is complete. Termination has happened, and the whole process is now done. Okay, questions about that? Everybody stand up and take in a deep breath. Stand up. Come on, you guys look like you're dead. Deep breath. Oh, don't crash too many things. Jumping jacks? One, two, 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 two. Ah. No? Just a jump? Should we go to a beer after class today? Would that put everybody in a, what's that? I'll buy. OK. That's the factor independent. Let's talk about the factor dependent. OK? So there's two ways to terminate transcription. You saw that it didn't take anything except for the formation of that jack to kick the RNA polymerase up and off of the DNA to stop the whole process. It didn't take another protein. It just simply took that base pairing for that thing to happen. Okay? Well, not all genes end in that base pairing thing. 
They don't all have the same sequence at the end. So they can't all use that jack it up mechanism in order to kick the RNA polymerase off. So there are other E. coli genes that use something called the factor dependent mechanism. And the factor dependent mechanism is what's depicted here. Now, both of the termination mechanisms, I think, are kind of cool. All right? The first one, of course, being the base pairing that kicks off the polymerase. This one's cool for a different reason. So you see here's that RNA, and we see the tail hanging off. But in this case, we don't have any specific sequences at the end that form that jack. Okay? In this case, a protein called Rho, that's, that, that's what looks like a P there, that's Rho, is a protein that binds to the 5 prime end of the messenger RNA. Okay? Rho binds to the 5 prime end of the messenger RNA. Now, the example I like to give to make this a real world thing for you is how many people in high school gym class had to climb to the top of a rope in your gymnasium? A few? When I had to do that when I was in gym class, I just dreaded it the first time. And I was scared to death. But then I got there, that was really kind of cool, right? So you have to climb this rope to get to the top of the gym, right? Imagine you're climbing that rope and somebody's letting it out as you're climbing it up. You have to climb faster than the person is letting it out if you hope to get to the top of the gym. And that's what Rho is having to do here. The RNA polymerase is scooting along. It's dropping tail off here. Rho is binding, and it's trying to catch up. So what's happening in this case is Rho is running a race against the RNA polymerase. If the RNA polymerase wins the race, then termination doesn't happen. Rho usually wins the race. Rho burns ATP to climb the rope. It's climbing the rope. And when Rho catches up with RNA polymerase, it does the following thing. It lifts its butt up and kicks it off of the DNA just like that Jack did. When that happens, termination occurs, transcription stops, and the messenger RNA is released. Well, how does, yeah, kicks the RNA polymerase off, and the RNA falls off as a consequence. OK? Well, how does Rho catch up? What slows down? That's really more the question. What slows down the RNA polymerase? It turns out what slows down the RNA polymerase is something that one of you guessed the other day. What do you suppose would slow down the RNA polymerase? We talked about it with respect to topoisomerases. Who said that? Yes. OK. Extra point of credit. Yes. GC base pairs. Because what happens with GC base pairs? They're harder to pull apart. And remember, the RNA polymerase is pulling them apart as it's moving down. And so it slows down when it hits stretches of GC. So long stretches of GC will act as termination sequences because the RNA polymerase will slow down and Rho will catch up with it. It's a cool system, a very cool system. Okay. Now people ask, when does the cell use Rho and when does the cell use the uh, factor independent mechanism? Or why doesn't Rho bind to all of the messenger RNAs? That's more commonly a question. And I don't have an answer for that. I'm not, sure it's, not completely sure it's known. Okay. But clearly, the factor independent mechanism has got to work. I'm sorry, the factor dependent mechanism has got to work when there's no such sequence to do that, uh, lifting the butt end up. Yes? So the j formation of the jack kicks everything off. Everything. The RNA falls off, the polymerase falls off, et cetera. And, and the same thing happens here. The Rho kicks everything off. Oh, everything. everything comes off. OK. So that's the factor-dependent, factor-independent mechanisms of termination of transcription. The cell has, at that point, uh, stopped everything. Pretty cool. OK. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about, in some detail now, 
about, I know you guys are just loving the detail, right? In some detail about the um, structure around genes. So here's the plus one. Whenever you see plus one, you can think transcription start. Okay, so there's the plus one sequence. And if we look uh, up here, we see that there are a variety of sequences that have different names. Okay, so we've been focused pretty much on the minus 10, minus 35 region here, and that's called the core promoter. Okay, that's the core promoter. And for our purposes, we're not going to worry about the other ones up here, but I'm just showing you this so that you recognize that there are other sequences that play roles in controlling the amount of a messenger RNA is made and the timing of when a messenger RNA is made. Both of those are important for a cell. I'll remind you also that we're still talking about prokaryotic cells. As complicated as this looks, it's a lot less complicated than what happens in eukaryotic cells. And I promise you we'll keep that simple as, as well. Okay. Um, oh, I just did that. Let's go to that operon I talked about. Let's talk about the lac operon, then we'll finish for the day. Okay. Lac operon. First of all, what's an operon? E. coli and all bacteria are very efficient in everything that they do. Okay. All cells are efficient. I shouldn't say that act like there's anything different about them, but bacteria in particular are efficient in the size and the use of their DNA. Bacteria have on the order of um, about 2,000 genes, 2,000 different proteins that they make. Okay? <clears throat> Human beings have about uh, 20 different, 20,000 different proteins that they make, and they make some variations of that, so the number is larger. But in terms of the actual number of proteins, it's about 20,000 which is only about 10 times as much as you have in a very simple bacterium. Yet our genome is 1,000 times larger than theirs is. Now, it isn't because our genes are bigger, because they're, they're not. Okay? We have a lot of gaps. We have a lot of spaces, and those spaces do a variety of things. But suffice it to say that bacteria are very tight in how well they pack together all of their genes. They don't waste space. Very, very tightly packed. So in bacteria, for example, it's not uncommon to see that you'll have one gene, end of the first gene, start of the second gene, end of the second gene, start of the third gene, with virtually no space, only a few nucleotides in between them. Okay? When we think about the transcription of those, okay, in bacteria, common genes that have a common function are usually grouped together. So the genes, for example, that are involved in metabolizing lactose, there are three of them, are grouped together on the bacteria's DNA. They're grouped together. And they're only needed when the bacterium encounters lactose. So if I have one, if the bacterium has one control mechanism, it can turn all of those genes on at the same time and turn all those genes off at the same time if they're all controlled by the same mechanism. And it turns out they are. So I need to give you some terms. An operon is a group of genes under the control of the same promoter. An operon is a group of genes under the control of the same promoter. One promoter, multiple genes. Eukaryotes don't have anything like that. They're very different. We'll talk about that. Okay? Prokaryotes group genes together. One promoter controls the whole batch of them. Okay? What we're looking at here is the control region for the lac operon. The lac operon contains the three genes that bacteria need to metabolize lactose. This is the control region. So plus one is right here. This region up here is called the control region. Okay. So this is the promoter region up here. The controls are the promoters. Right. This is the promoter. Now, 
what I'm going to show you is, first of all, this. Here is where the RNA polymerase would bind. There's the minus 3 up to about the minus 40 or 48, okay? Remember, the minus 35 comes to here and it stretches upward. So there's the minus 35 up to about the start of transcription. So the RNA polymerase is going to want to bind in this region right here, okay? If we look over here, we see something called the repressor binding site. There's a protein called the LAC repressor. And the LAC repressor recognizes this sequence in this region right here. And you'll notice that that region overlaps with the region that the RNA polymerase would like to bind to. You can imagine these two proteins butting heads at some point, and that's exactly what will happen. If the, RNA, if the LAC repressor binds, the RNA polymerase butts heads, it can't fit in there. It doesn't do anything. That's why it's called the LAC repressor, because when it's present, it represses transcription. RNA polymerase can't bind when the repressor is bound. Everybody with me? If the repressor is not present, RNA polymerase can bind and transcription can start. Everybody with me there? So the last thing of today is this guy here, cap binding site. Cap is another protein. helps the RNA polymerase to bind. Why does it need help binding? Any theories? Why would RNA polymerase need help binding? Excellent. Right there. Okay? We talked statistics earlier. Here's a sequence that if the, if the polymerase is left to itself, it won't bind it very often. However, if this guy is present, it turns it on like crazy. We're overcoming the statistics. So extra point of credit right there, okay? All right? If this, this is present, it turns this whole thing on. Now, tomorrow I'm going, or not tomorrow, Friday I'm going to talk about what puts this on here, the repressor on here, or what puts this on over here. It's a one or the other, essentially. Understanding that allows us to understand how it is that bacteria respond to um, uh, the environmental conditions that they find themselves in. Yes, ma'am. That's correct. Okay, I've got two things for you at the end. One is we're going to sing, and if we sing loud enough, I guess you know what the second thing is, right? <laughs> this is an easy one to sing, guys. Phosphodiesters are the bonds of RNA that support a ribopolymer made of GCU and A. The RNA polymerase binds to a tata -ta box. And copies from the template strand all along the way it walks. Initiation of transcription thus proceeds. From the close to open complexing in the DNA it reads. The sigma factor gets released, its work is over fast. Polymerase can then advance after this step has been passed. In elongation, the polymerizing spree moves along the way and fits and starts synthesizing 5 to 3. The RNA is floppy and it dangles from one end. Oh, that's a most important thing for you to comprehend. Then termination finishes the RNAs, thanks to protein row or hairpin forms that release polymerase. So this describes transcription steps in three-part harmonies. Here's hoping with this melody you can learn it all with ease. All right, piece of paper, name, ID number, and get out of here and enjoy the sun. <laughs>